The New York Jets select Sauce Gardner. Sauce Gardner is a New York Jet! Waggy Sauce Gardner. <laughs> I love Sauce. I love his tape. I love his press technique. I love his confidence. He has everything you want to see in the position. And I think Robert Sala in this scheme is the perfect. It's it's a hand in glove fit for him, man. Garrett Wilson. Uh, it's Garrett Wilson. The New York Jets have just got two big time playmakers. I believe that Garrett Wilson is going to be the most impactful rookie receiver mm. in this class. And I think we see Zach Wilson play like he did the last six games of the year, times 10, and have a phenomenal second season. Wow, you think- yeah! 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 Let's go, man! Johnson! Brees Hall, running back, Iowa State. Brees Hall, oh my God, they got him! They won offense. They went with the best running back in the draft. Jeremy Rucker, oh my God! The Long Island native is a New York Jet! J E T S! Jet, Jet, Jet! Let's go! What up, man? Shout out Just Media. This is the guy right here, man. Y'all stay tuned. Get with it. Appreciate you, my man. Big season. Yo, what is good? Jets Nation, welcome back to another Jets Media live stream. And today we got a fun little stream for you guys. We're going to be breaking down the full roster, going to the starting lineup on the offense, the starting lineup on the defense. Also, of course, going into the depth of the roster. Who's going to be backing up who? I have a couple graphics to share with you guys to break down each and every one of the players are that are going into week number one with the New York Jets. Shout out to everybody watching this live or you watch this on replay. I greatly appreciate you guys joining the Jets media live stream. Um, I am, I'm really excited to break down this roster because we finally get to see what it's looking like heading into week number one of the NFL season after the roster cuts yesterday, after all the craziness of who was signing to the practice squad uh who's not getting claimed who is getting claimed off the roster so we got a lot of things to break down in today's live stream regarding the new york jets roster heading into the season so if you guys are just joining into the show do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button whether you're watching it live or you're watching on replay i greatly appreciate each and every one of you guys tuning in of course and then excuse me do not forget to hit that subscribe button as we're inching close to the new goal of 13,000 subscribers could we get 13k before the season begins Let's see. Let's see. So let's get right into it, man. Shout out to everybody tuning in. Let's see who's in the chat. We got Ansi. What's good? Go Jets. Hawk. Let's go. Yes, sir. Are we happy, Richie? Yes, we are happy. I made a graphic um, about this New York Jets offense and defense, and I'm excited to break down um, what it's looking like because I feel like us as Jets fans, a lot of things happened in the past couple of days that we were not expecting. So now we can take a step back look at this roster and really evaluate what it's looking like in terms of the starting lineup, in terms of the depth, certain packages, uh, the coaching staff in particular, of course. So I'm really excited to break it all down. Shout out Terrence, Jets Nation, Orlando, Goat, Goat, Goat. You're the Goat, Orlando. Appreciate that, my man. So without further ado, let's get right into the show. All righty. So first and foremost, we're going to be breaking down the defense. Now, how about this? I made a similar graphic to this um go heading into otas where there's a lot more players and now this is the final defense the 53 man roster this does not include any of the practice squad members um just so you guys know if you're wondering where guys are at um such as bradley and and jonathan marshall and hamza Najaldeen, those are the guys that made the 50 uh the, the practice squad but here we're going to talk about the the defense on paper heading into the season so i want to know your guys thoughts in the chat First and foremost, what really stands out to you guys the most um, in terms of this defense? So we're going to start off with the, with the safety position. So the four safeties that are going into the starting um, defense is going to be Jordan Whitehead and LaMarcus Joyner. Um, sorry, I see a little uh, typo in LaMarcus's name. Sorry, guys. I always type it a little fast. Um, but and unfortunately, I cannot fix it right now because I it's just like a photo. Whatever. So Jordan Whitehead and LaMarcus Joyner are the two starting safeties with Tony Adams and Ashton Davis as the backup safeties. Now, this is definitely the first position that a lot of Jets fans were confused about um, because 
We were expecting at least Jason Pimnock and Will Parks to make the roster. Remember, guys, Will Parks is on the practice squad, so he is still on the roster. Technically, if one of these guys go down with an injury or if one of them are just not playing good football, Will Parks will be added to the active roster eventually throughout the season. Um, so I'm really excited about Jordan Whitehead. I think Jordan Whitehead has been for a forgotten name throughout this whole offseason process because we signed him in free agency. We we're excited when we signed him. He, we didn't really get to see him a lot in preseason because he only played, I think, like one or two series uh, week number three against the um, New York Giants. So it's not like we got to see a lot of Jordan Whitehead to get excited about. But guys, I think Whitehead is one of the most underrated pieces to this entire defense. And I'm so excited to see what he can do. Rocking that number six. He's going to be that guy that's going to be... Um, you know, all over the place, whether lining up in the box, lining up in the line of scrimmage, lining up high, lining up down low as a linebacker. I mean, he's going to be everywhere. And I really feel like Jets fans are going to grow to love Jordan Whitehead's game because he plays with a, a certain violence to him, a passion for the game that is really contagious. And he's a veteran leader, leader guys, and he's really young as well. So I'm excited to see what Jordan Whitehead can do. Definitely the most talented safety that we got. LaMarcus Joyner, obviously the, um, the uh, veteran free the veteran free agent we brought in two years ago. Now this is his first year that he's trying to be healthy. Last year, he was the starting safety alongside Marcus May. And then LaMarcus uh, Joyner went down with a season-ending injury in week number one last year against the Panthers. So now he has a chance to be healthy next to Jordan Whitehead, be that veteran leadership. Robert Sala said he's a big piece of this defense because of the communication he brings to the secondary for the young guys like Sauce, of course. Um, and then the backups, you know, Tony Adams, what a phenomenal story Tony Adams is. Undrafted free agent out of Illinois. And I feel like um, this is going to be one of those diamond in the rough players that the Jets uh, coaching staff are going to try to groom over time. If you really dig deep into the film in the preseason, he looked really good, man. And you can tell that he's somebody that the Jets did not just, you know, add him to this 53-man roster just for shits and giggles. He definitely proved in the OTA process in training camp, in the preseason, behind the scenes in the coaching, uh, you know, meetings, behind the scenes in the positional meetings, that he is doing everything he needs to do to make this roster. And I thought it was really cool. This morning, Robert Sala spoke to the media and he was talking about Tony Adams. And in his pre-draft interview with the Jets, he told position uh, coach for the Jets that he's coming to take someone's job. It was his, because he understands the only way he's making a roster if he, if is if he makes the roster over somebody that was supposed to make the roster. And he did that over Will Parks. He did that over Jason Pinnock. So he definitely took someone's job. I feel like Tony Adams is a really interesting story. And I'm excited to see what he can do. He's going to be backing up Jordan Whitehead. And then, of course, Ashton Davis. Uh-oh, here we go. Ashton Davis. Now, this is the guy that the New York Jets fans are really upset that made the roster. Um, listen, I understand where the Jets fans are coming from. But it seems like the Jets are prioritizing Ashton Davis because of his special teams, because of his character, and because they feel still feel like he has a lot of room to grow. Um, that's what Robert Salas said, speaking to the media yesterday, when he talked about Ashton Davis making the roster. They really value his character and value his special teams and value his ability to grow into a safety. Um, now, listen, I know that Jets fans don't like him and they prefer Jason Pinnock. Um, I'm not going to really say other than that, that Ashton Davis needs to play better ball. If his name is called, he cannot, you know, overcommit on a run play and then let a running back just uh, run past you. You have to be able to tackle in the second and third level if you want to be a good safety to prevent those long touchdown runs. You also have to be good in coverage. There's a lot of things that Ashton Davis needs to improve on, and there's no denying he's a freak athlete. I mean, his athleticism is never an issue. His speed is there. You know, his ball instincts are there. His football IQ needs to work, be worked on a little bit. So those are the safety break, the safeties. Let's get into the linebackers. The linebackers. So we got CJ Mosley and Quincy Williams. I put Quincy Williams as a starter here because if you guys notice in the preseason, Quincy Williams and CJ Mosley were out there with the starters in week three when the starting defense was out there against the Giants and Quan Alexander came in as a backup. Now, this is the nickel package. Um, I don't, You guys can't see the nickel package. Hold on take this out so you see like the nickel nickel package down here in the bottom right that basically means there's two linebackers and a, and a corner uh the four you know the uh with michael carter out there in the field that means there's going to be two linebackers when michael carter's off the field there's going to be three linebackers that's when you can put cj mosley quincy williams and quan alexander on the field together um so you know when it comes to the the, the linebackers cj mosley coming off a phenomenal individual season last year he had 168 combined tackles individually now, is he going to be able to put it all together? I don't know. We will find out. 
in terms of a team defense. You know, CJ Mosley had such a great season individually, but it was unfortunate because you couldn't really see it carry into the entire team as a defense. So CJ has a really big time uh, season ahead of him in terms of really making sure that everyone's lined up properly, getting their mind right, being that leader and being individually better in coverage because that's he was a liability last year in coverage and being able to be there whenever he needs to be, you know, running sideline to sideline, being a, a really good veteran in terms of play rec, understanding what's coming, being that guy in the meeting rooms to prepare, to prepare for the opponents like the Baltimore Ravens. He should be able to know what play is coming before he, it's even called. That's the type of defense that CJ Mosley brings to this New York Jets squad. Uh, Quincy Williams, now obviously he's a player that a lot of Jets fans are, you know, on the fence about. Um, we all prefer Quan Alexander to play because he's an established veteran. He's an established guy in this league, whereas Quincy Williams is still trying to make a name for himself. And he, uh, the Jets are really high on Quincy Williams, as, as you can see. You saw that terrible, terrible, terrible play he had in the preseason week number one by getting absolutely, you know, hitting Jalen Hurts way out of bounds, inexcusable, got fined, rightfully so. Um, he's got a lot of work on on that. I do like the violence that Quincy Williams plays with. I do like the tenacity. I do like the sense of urgency. I do like his hard-hitting ability and his, ta his open field tackling and his ability to get tackles for loss, blitzing the quarterback, all that stuff. But he does need to improve on coverage. That is a big thing that he's a liability in so far in his career with the Jets is he really feels like he gets eaten up over the middle, which is why I'm excited that Quan Alexander is a member of the New York Jets because he is a very good uh, pass coverage a linebacker, which is why it's going to be pivotal to have Quan Alexander on this roster. You know that he's going to be subbing in. He's not going to be on the sideline throughout the entire game. He's going to be playing with the Jets on certain packages. So just because he's behind Quincy Williams right here on this graphic does not mean he's not going to play. Again, the reason why I have Quan Alexander behind Quincy Williams is simply because of what we saw for week three in the final preseason game. The defense, um, Quincy Williams and CJ were the two starting linebackers with Quan coming off the bench. Now, Jamie and Sherwood is a fourth linebacker who made the roster. Awesome to see. Um, awesome to see Jamie and Sherwood make this team. And you can see the development that he's making, man. Physically, mentally, play recognition, understanding where the ball needs to be um, on the opposing offense and knows where he needs to be in terms of, you know, play rec. Uh, he's going to be that linebacker that's going to be developed behind CJ Mosley. You know, the goal here is for Jamie and Sherwood to become the starting linebacker when CJ Mosley is, you know, his contract is up with the Jets. Uh, that is the best case scenario because that means we develop Jamie Sherwood to be that linebacker for the future. I think Jamie Sherwood has a lot of potential in this league, and I think he is on the verge of breaking out in year number two. Um, he's going to have a really a, a really good season underneath his belt. Again, learning behind CJ Mosley. I really hope he can stay healthy because remember last year he uh, ruptured his Achilles. So it's good to see him healthy and ready to go. And I really hope that he can stay healthy because him absorbing everything, him taking mental reps, and uh, we'll see if he even cracks the the, the rotation because CJ Mosley is ahead of him on the depth chart, obviously. So let's hope CJ does not go down with any injuries. So guys, we are breaking down the starting defense right now, and then we'll get into the offense afterwards. If you're enjoying the show right now, please do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button, whether you're watching it live or you're watching it on replay. We got around 130 people tuning into the show right now. We greatly appreciate that. Um, I really hope you guys are enjoying the show. We have 43 likes with 130 people tuning in. If you're enjoying it, please do me a favor. Hit that thumbs up button so we can get as many Jets fans in here as possible. Now, let's get into the secondary on the, um, the cornerback room. So, the corners. We're going to start off with the two outside starting cornerbacks, DJ Reed and Sauce Gardner. Let's start off with Sauce. Sauce Gardner. Coming off a of preseason, not getting targeted once, living up to the, the name of Sauce Gardner immediately. So Sauce Gardner is going to have a very interesting rookie season because he's probably one of the most hyped up players on this entire Jets team by the national media, not talking about Jets fans. But when it comes to, I mean, Jets fans are hyping up Sauce as well, which we should be because he's that good. But, you know, coming out, like before he was even drafted, he was hyped up. Sauce Gardner was been hyped up ever since his phenomenal season his phenomenal career at cincinnati so you know that his name is going to be talked about by the national media a lot he backed it up in the preseason so far by the ball not going his way once i'm really excited to see um when he does get tested what what it's going to be like where, where what's the separation like if you go into the film room and you watch what sauce garner was doing and all those pass coverage uh, reps that he had you know he was locking people down i mean his his football instincts 
his ability to drop back in zone, know where he needs to be, whether it's man coverage or zone coverage. He has a really good feel for the game of football. And, you know, the physical tools that he has is just uncoachable. I mean, being six foot two, six foot three, being able to, you know, match people up with that physicality, also being able to match them up with the speed and quickness. You love Sauce Garter. I mean, everything you want to see from Sauce, he displayed um, in the preseason and training camp. So I'm so excited to see his debut week number one against the Baltimore Ravens and see him for a full four games. DJ Reed is going to be a very fun player to watch as well. Let's hope that he can stay healthy because he's definitely been banged up a little bit throughout training camp. Um, DJ Reed is a really big X factor for this defense because I feel like if he can replicate what he did for the Seahawks last year, this defense is going to another dimension that we cannot even expect. Because if Sauce Garner stays healthy and Sauce Garner plays at the caliber we're expecting, and DJ Reed plays similarly to his uh, season that he had with the Seahawks last year, then this defense, this secondary is going to be very good because the outside edges are going to be locked down. Because what DJ Reed did last year, if you look at all the stats, he was up there with all the top corners. Now, his name is not being talked about in the national media at all, which I, abs which I actually like. It's underrated. DJ Reed likes it as well. No one's talking about him. Everyone's just, oh, DJ Reed is a top five in, in uh, you know, pass breakups, top five in this, top five in that. But he's, he's in the same breath as all these top corners in the league, but no one's talking about him. And I like that because now he has a perfect opportunity to be in the New York market where if he does ball out, and if he does have a season like he did last year, people are going to be talking about him. People are going to be talking about him. Now, Now the thing that DJ Reed needs to realize is the ball is going to be going his way a lot because it's obvious that, <laughs> that nobody wants to throw to Sauce Garner's side of the field. Now, DJ Reed is probably going to accept that challenge, and I think he's going to do great things. Now, getting into the third and uh, final starting corner, that's Michael Carter II. If you guys watch my channel, you guys know that I think that Michael Carter II is the one player on this defense that I think is going to break out as a star. Um, now, when I say a star, I think he's going to break out to be one of the top young slot corners in the NFL. You saw what he did in his um, in the preseason finale against the Giants in one quarter. He had a sack and he had an interception. I think Michael Carter II is destined to be one of the top young corners in the NFL in the slot for a multitude of reasons. I mean, the, as a fifth-round pick last year, to do what he did all season long, being consistent week in and week out, lining up man-to-man -man on tight ends, lining up in zone, Getting his ball, getting his hands on the football, being really sticky in coverage, being able to blitz the quarterback. He sacked Tom Brady. I mean, the list goes on and on of what Michael Carter II did as a rookie last year. So for him to go into year number two and him continuously proving the coaching staff that he is the future of this slot cornerback position, I am so excited to see what the Jets are going to do. And obviously, the Jets are really um, uh, high on Michael Carter II because they don't have a backup slot. Now, obviously, that's unfortunate for depth purposes, so we really have to hope that Carter stays healthy. So Michael Carter II is that guy that I think is going to become one of the top young corners in the NFL in terms of the slot. And, man, the starting three corners that we have, definitely one of the best that we've had in quite some time, especially when you want to talk about youth. Sauce Gardner is a rookie, Carter II coming into year number two, and then DJ Reed. Uh, at 25 years old. So the three starting corners are so young. And then even the depth is young at the cornerback spot. We got Bryce Hall backing up Sauce Gardner. Um, Bryce Hall, obviously, now I feel like Jets fans are over Bryce Hall after that one game against the Falcons. But please don't take that one preseason game and think that Bryce Hall's a bum all of a sudden. What Bryce Hall did last year, all 17 games he started and played every single snap, he was a very good cornerback in the NFL. Is he great? No. Is he above... You know, at the top of the level, no. That's why the Jets replaced him. But Bryce Hall is an absolute perfect piece to this Jets defense to develop for the long run and have a depth behind Sauce or DJ Reed. I got all the confidence in the world. If unfortunately one of Sauce or DJ Reed gets nicked up, Bryce Hall subbed in. Hall is absolutely phenomenal depth on this roster. He had a tremendous training camp. And Robert Salas said, do not let that one game fool you. Bryce Hall has been dominating camp to the point where they had to give him first team reps and... um subbing in and out with Sauce Garner. So Bryce Hall is tremendous depth, as well as Brendan Eccles. I mean, Brendan Eccles last year as a rookie, 
it was him and Bryce Hall as a starting outside corners by week number one. And Brennan Eccles really showed up. So the fact that the Jets have two backup corners that was their two starting corners last year shows you how much this depth really is on this New York Jets defense, which is why it's so fun to see the depth all across this roster. Um, so the fact that we have Bryce Hall and Brennan Eccles as our backups and those two guys who are starters last year, they have experience in the system. It's not like we have backups that's never been you know, playing with this Jets organization. Whereas if unfortunately one of the top corners goes down, we don't got confidence in Eccles or Hall to step in. I got confidence in Hall. I got confidence in Eccles to step up. You guys cannot say that Bryce Hall sucks with a straight face after you watch what he did last year with this Jets team. He was a very good uh, young cornerback in the NFL last year playing all 17 games. And then Justin Hardy, obviously, is a special teams gunner. Hopefully, he does not have to take any snaps at cornerback because that would be a nightmare. That means that the injuries are really piling up. Now, going into the defensive line, probably the most young and dominant deep positions there is on this defense, and that is the D-line. Probably the best position group on the entire roster, to be honest. So, starting off with the starters, I mean, they're all going to play, first of all. Um, I have John Franklin Myers lined up as a D tackle, but he's definitely going to be lining up on the defensive end as well. We got Carl Lawson, Quinton Williams, John Franklin Myers, Jermaine Johnson. Um, if I had to guess the starting four in like first and first and 10 defenses on the field at fir uh, for the first time, it's going to be Carl Lawson, Quinton Williams, Solomon Thomas, and then John Franklin Myers on the end. That's probably going to be what the uh, starting defensive line is going to look like. And then on passing downs, this is probably what's, what it's going to become with Jermaine on the outside or even Bryce Huff on the outside because he's really good at a prototypical um, edge rusher. So going, let, let's break down player by player. We're going to start off with Carl Lawson. Now, Carl Lawson is a player that, listen, last year he was the talk of training camp. He was annihilating everybody. He was the guy. He was just absolutely destroying anybody he was going up against, whether it was joint practices or whether it was against the New York Jets. Now, unfortunately, we all know what happened, but fortunately – He's back. He's healthy. He's going to week number one. He is going to be starting for the Jets and playing all season long, hopefully. Now, Carl Lawson is one of the biggest X factors for this defense because he is the guy that needs to get to the quarterback consistently in order for the New York Jets to get uh, success on this defensive side of the football. We all know that it starts at the line of scrimmage for this Jets team to get success at, on this defense. you got to disrupt the quarterback. If you allow the quarterback time in the pocket, he's going to pick apart the defense. That's the unfortunate reality. But the good thing is the secondary is revamped, so hopefully that's not the case. So if Carl Lawson could be 75% of what we expected him from last year, that's a big plus. Quinnen Williams, I think, is the breakout player of this defense this year in terms of becoming a pro bowler, becoming one of the dominant defensive tackles in the NFL. He is going to do just that. I promise you that. If everybody stays healthy around Quinton Williams, and of course, more importantly, Quinton stays healthy of his own, he's going to be dominant this year. He had a tremendous training camp, disrupting all over the place. Had a really good uh, connection with Lincoln Tomlinson, you know, having that competition with him. You know, iron sh uh, sharpens iron, that cliche term. Um, Quinton Williams, in his first time we saw him in the preseason, dominated, had a sack, of course. Now that was against the backup Giants uh, offense, but still... The, the point still stands. I think this is the season where we're going to see a consistent Quinton Williams week in and week out disrupting players, disrupting plays, tackle for losses, sacks, a quarterback pressures, quarterback hits, you know, just being that leader and being that guy that sets the tone on defense early on that defensive line. Now, John Franklin Myers, I believe, is going to have a very good season as well. Now, some Jets fans, I don't know how, but some Jets fans think he's overrated. I cannot disagree more. I think John Franklin Myers is one of the key pieces to the reason why this defensive line is so deep and versatile. He's the one guy in this defensive line, and I think Michael Clemens is going to become this as well in the, in the future and the more he develops. He's the one guy in this defensive line that can line up on the inside and the outside. Do you guys have any idea how, um, you know, how valuable it is to have a defensive lineman that can line up on the edge and line up on the defensive tackle spot? That is tremendous. So John Franklin Myers dominated the season last year to start off, gets that extension, and then he had a dominant game against the Houston Texans where he had a two sacks, interception, basically single-handedly won the game for the New York Jets that, that game. And um, if you don't, if you just look at the box score 
then you just don't know what you're talking about John Franklin Myers. You got to watch the tape, understand that he's consistently winning his one-on-ones. And I think John Franklin Myers is going to have a really good season this year as well, next to Quinton Williams, next to Carl Lawson, next to all these guys around him. Jermaine Johnson. Now, Jermaine Johnson is interesting because obviously we're all pumped up. We got him in the draft. He's a big-time rookie that we traded up for. Um, now, the one thing I noticed about Jermaine Johnson in the preseason is he plays with a high motor. He definitely does not take any plays off. He attacks the quarterback at all times. He did not get any sacks in the preseason, which is a little unfortunate. But Jermaine Johnson is going to be a steady guy that's going to be, you know, getting better and better throughout the season. We cannot expect Jermaine Johnson has come out there week number one and dominate the game of football. He's going to be one of those rookies that I think is going to take a little bit to really find his groove in the NFL, going up against top-tier offensive linemen, going up against top-tier running backs and quarterbacks. You know, it's going to take a little bit for Jermaine Johnson to get uh, accustomed to the NFL game, and that's totally expected. And then uh, Vinny Curry, the veteran, he might be on the injured reserve list or the pup list to start it off. He's injured, so we'll see about Vinny Curry. Sheldon Rankins, he's also a little banged up. We'll see if he can do anything because Sheldon Rankins, you know, he's the pass down. He's like a pass rusher in terms of the interior defensive lineman. So we'll see if he does anything. Um, we got a, a donation to get to real quick some, from Bang. $2. Thank you so much, my man. So we have one safety. Joiner is injured and Davis is lost. Um, nah, don't forget about Tony Adams, my man. Tony Adams is the man. Appreciate the, the donation though, my man. Um, Solomon Thomas. I think Solomon Thomas is going to have a, a way bigger impact as some Jets fans are expecting. He's going to be the starter defensive tackle next to Quinn and Williams when JFM is on the outside. Uh, Solomon Thomas, former third overall pick. We all know that he never lived up to that expectation over there in San Francisco. But if he can stay healthy, I think he's going to provide a big time impact on this defensive line with the experience in the system. He's probably not going to be a guy that's going to disrupt a lot of things in terms of sacks and tackle for losses, but I think he's going to be a good body in a steady rotation of this defensive line. Um, Jacob Martin, you know, he has speed coming off the edge. He's going to be that guy that is um, coming, coming out there on the edge. So I do feel like Jacob Martin is going to provide a big time impact in terms of just the rotation. And Bryce Huff. Bryce Huff is going to be out there, you could say, on even third down pass rushing opportunities. Third and long, you want to get to the quarterback. Bryce Huff is that prototypical guy. Just put your hand in the ground. Go get to the – go attack the quarterback. Uh, Nathan Shepard, definitely not my favorite player on this Jets team. Um, if there's one guy I wish got cut on this defensive line, it's Nathan Shepard. I would prefer it to be uh, Jonathan Marshall uh, on this 53 over Nathan Shepard. But, I mean – here I am complaining about defensive lineman number 10. I mean, okay, who cares? You know what I mean? Like, that that's what I've realized. Like, all of us Jets fans are complaining about Ashton Davis. We're complaining about Shepard. We're complaining about Ty Johnson. All the players we're complaining about are, like, backups. Like, they're last on their depth chart. It, it's a good problem to have that we're worried about these guys. Ken with the $5 super chat. Thank you so much, Ken. Appreciate you, my man. Love your streams, Richie. I'm a Dolphins fan from the AFC East Roundtable, but just want to show some love. Ken, I appreciate that big time, my brother. Really does mean a lot to me that I got some Dolphins fans. I got all fan bases across the AFC East showing love to Jets media. Really does mean a lot to me that you're showing love over here, Ken. If you guys are not aware, we got our first ever episode on the AFC East dedicated YouTube channel last night on the AFC East Roundtable. So if you guys want to check out that episode that is down below in the description and you got to subscribe to the AFC East Roundtable YouTube channel because we used to have a rotation it would be on my channel then TD's channel and then it'll rotate but now we're going to be on one channel every single week so make sure you guys check that out that's down below in the description and check out the episode last night and also to all my Jets fans watching this we need Jets Nation active in that AFC East Roundtable Ken I love you my man I appreciate it but there's a little too much Dolphins fans in the AFC East Roundtable live chat last night we need Jets Nation active. There were Jets fans. I'm not saying there weren't Jets fans, but we need more Jets fans. We need everybody that's watching this right now to stay tuned. Every single Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time, we need to be active in that live chat so we can get Jets Nation active because there's too many Dolphins fans and not enough Jets fans. So we need you guys represented in the uh, AFC East Roundtable next week. Appreciate the uh, support, Ken. So where was I? Oh, yeah, I was, I was talking crap about Shepard. Let's get into Michael Clemens, who is probably one of the most fun players to watch on the defensive line in the preseason. Michael Clemens was dominating preseason for so many reasons. He plays with a high motor, plays with tenacity, plays with a sense of urgency. 
does not take any plays off. Sprints after the ball until the ball is dead. Even if the ball is 15 yards down the field, he's sprinting at full speed. The quarterback breaks free to the right. He is sprinting at you. He is going to absolutely kill you with the football until the ball is dead. Michael Clemens is slowly becoming my favorite player on this defense, and it's slowly becoming, he's becoming a fan favorite for multitude of reasons. Michael Dan Clemens. Remember the name. He's going to be disrupting uh, quarterbacks and defenses and offenses by week number one. So before we get into the offense and break down all the players on the offensive side of the ball, if you guys could do me a favor and hit that like button, it really does mean a lot. Let's get to 100 likes. We have 250 people tuning into the show with 80 likes. So let's get to 100 likes before we hop into the offensive side of the ball. We broke down everybody on the defense that made the 53-man roster. We're not going to really break down the, the practice squad players because um, we already broke that down in a video yesterday, even though we did get uh, Calvin Jackson, which is a big-time move. I did not, I was not live when that move was announced, so that's a big-time plus. Sorry, had, had to get hydrated there. I've been talking for a half hour straight. Half hour straight. All right. Here we go. 99 likes. Thank you, guys. We, we needed 100 likes before the offense, and you guys did just that. You guys are the best. This is why I love you guys. This season is going to be awesome, man. This season is going to be great. All right, let's do it. Jets offense. Well, first and foremost, say hello to Mike LaFleur, but I'm going to put myself over him because there's nowhere else to put me. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. I'm going to have to put myself over your over your head. Here we go. The New York Jets 2022 offense. All right. So there's a lot of names. I tried to organize this as best as I could. So where do we start? We'll start with the quarterbacks. So the three quarterbacks on the 53-man roster, Zach Wilson, who is obviously the starting quarterback. Whenever he's healthy, I do not want to hear anybody saying, well, yeah, well, what if Joe Flacco's playing good football and Zach Wilson's healthy? What do we do? When Zach Wilson's healthy, he's the starting quarterback. Now, there is an outside chance that Zach Wilson plays week one. I'm not gonna put my I'm not gonna put my expectations in that. But if Zach Wilson's practicing by Monday, he's starting. <laughs> now, I don't know if the Jets are going to want to do that. Um, and I also don't even know if Zach Wilson can be prepared for that. But he is um, definitely looking like a player that is rehabbing well. Joe Flacco, if he's going to be the starting quarterback week one, listen, I don't know what to expect from Joe Flacco. All I want to see from him is making the right decisions in week one. If he's starting, getting the ball into space, timing, no carelessness with the ball like he did in, in against the Giants with that interception. And getting rid of the ball fast because he cannot rely on his athleticism to evade pressure because he's pretty huge, right? Um, not huge, sorry. He's old, so he doesn't really have the uh, mobility like he once did and never really was a mobile quarterback to begin with. So Joe Flacco, if he does have to start, get rid of the ball quickly. One, two, drop back, get rid of the ball take a couple deep shots, and get the ball into the playmaker's hands in space. That's his job. Uh, Mike White, quarterback number three. Let's hope that he doesn't have to touch the field because that means Flacco's healthy and Zach Wilson gets back onto the field. Now getting into the running backs. The four running backs into the 53-man roster. Michael Carter, Brees Hall, Bam Knight, Ty Johnson. Michael Carter was the first running back on the field for the starting lineup on the offense. Now listen, My Michael Carter and Brees Hall are going to be splitting carries to start things off. They're going to ride with a hot hand throughout the game. But Michael Carter, I think, is going to get a lot more looks than a lot of people expect early on in the season, for sure. Nothing against Brees Hall, but I think Michael Carter deserves a lot of reps um, with this with this team. I know he had a fumble, um, but I do think Michael Carter and Brees Hall are going to be one of those uh, running back duos that's going to be must-start in fantasy football. Like, you're going to see Carter being a starting running back, maybe at the flex, 
for, for certain leagues and deep leagues. And Brees Hall is a running back too in certain leagues. So it's pretty cool that the Jets have two potential starting options at the run, running back spot in, fa in fantasy football. Bam Knight, you absolutely love the story that he made the roster. Undrafted free agent, was phenomenal in special teams in terms of kick returning. You saw him have the, the longest run in any running back throughout the preseason. He has power, he has vision, he has speed, he has everything you want at the running back spot. I absolutely love that uh, Bam Knight is the guy um, that made this roster. Now, Ty Johnson, listen, Ty Johnson is definitely um, not my favorite running back ever. <laughs> I mean, ever since that game he had when he like dropped four straight passes on third downs, it made me like freak out. And um, listen, if Ty Johnson is running back four, whatever you know you can't you can't have four running backs you love uh let's just hope that ty johnson never really has to see the see the field as much because that means hall and carter are healthy and they're and they're um impacting the game and i really hope knight gets the gets the gig over him getting into wide receivers now let's do this six wide receivers Corey davis elijah moore braxton burials garrett wilson denzel mims jeff smith now i see some people in the chat asking why aren't some people starting listen they're all going to be starting. Listen, the, the starting four receivers, I just couldn't fit four receivers in this graphic. Just pretend there's four receivers and then Garrett Wilson's there. Corey Davis, Braxton Berrios, Elijah Moore, and Garrett Wilson. Those are the four receivers that are going to be starting out there. They're going to have four receivers on certain packages. So don't get, don't get discouraged that you see Garrett Wilson as a backup. He's not a backup. He's going to be playing. Okay. I just couldn't fit him on the, I couldn't fit him on the, uh, the damn thing. But Braxton Berrios, by the way, starter starting slot receiver for this Jets team. And I think Jets fans need to start realizing that because I think a lot of Jets fans are forgetting about Braxton here. And that's okay that we can forget about him because that means we have a lot of other talent around him that we are excited about, like Elijah Moore and Garrett Wilson. That's rightfully so. But Braxton Berrios, I'm expecting him to have one of his better, his best season of his career with the Jets. Um, I'm really excited to see what Braxton Berrios does because that touchdown he had, against the Giants shows you the playmaking ability when the ball's in his hands, man. A quick screen to him. There's like three Giants ready to tackle him. He somehow just, just sprints up the sideline for the 22-yard touchdown. Braxton Berrios is going to be really big time. Really big time. And I'm honestly, I don't want to be sound like I'm biased when it comes to the Jets and fantasy, but in PPR leagues, watch out for Braxton Berrios on the waiver wire because I have a feeling he is going to be one of those guys that a lot of people are going to try to get in the waiver wire by week two, week three because of the PPR. I think he's going to get like four to five potentially receptions a game, maybe like 35, 40 yards. Some games get in the end zone and he's going to put up a, a decent amount of fantasy points consistently, like seven points to like 12, 13 points on, on a week to week basis in PPR leagues. Watch out for Braxton Barrios, man. I think he's going to be heavily involved in this offense than more than people think. Um, Corey Davis as a starting outside receiver for this Jets team. You guys know how I feel about Corey Davis. Corey Davis, I think, is being a little underappreciated by Jets fans as, uh, as well as Braxton Berrios. Yo, 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 what up, man? Shout out Jets Media. This is the guy right here, man. Y'all stay tuned. Be with it. Appreciate you, my man. Big season. That's my guy. Um, no, but all kidding aside, Bra uh, Corey Davis, um, if you look at his numbers last year, Two touchdowns week number one. He had that phenomenal uh, game against the Tennessee Titans. He had a couple games where he had a little couple drops. My thing about Corey Davis is he he's not a prototypical number one receiver. And last year, he was thrown into the role to be that number one receiver because we didn't have anybody else to take on that role. We're not going to expect a rookie Elijah Moore to be the number one receiver. You do not want to put that pressure on a rookie. You're not going to put that pressure on Keelan Cole. You're not going to ask... Um, Jamison Crowder, you know, all the receivers we had last year, there was nobody else that could step up to be the number one receiver besides Corey Davis. So he was thrown into the role. It worked in week number one. Zach Wilson kept force feeding him the ball, but Corey Davis is not a number one receiver. Corey Davis is an excellent, great number three receiver, which is what he is, which is why I think Corey Davis is destined to have a very good season if he stays if he stays healthy. I think people are underrating him. He is a captain on this team. He is a veteran. He knows how to get open. He has uh, reliable hands, 
and he's a really good route runner. And I feel like people just keep bringing up like, oh, he's a bust because he was a fifth or sixth overall pick and he never panned out. Like the best part about this, guys, is we're not expecting Corey Davis to be the number one guy. We have Elijah Moore and Garrett Wilson to do just that. And then it's going to open things up for Corey Davis. Corey Davis had his most productive season in his career when he was next to A.J. Brown, where all the focus was on, was on A.J. Brown, open things up for Corey Davis, which is why I think Elijah Moore is going to open things up for uh, Corey Davis tremendously, which is why I think he's going to have a big-time season this year. If Corey Davis stays healthy, I think he's going to have like 800-plus receiving yards. I genuinely believe that um, because I think that – and also, before we finish off the Corey Davis talk, and now Jets fans don't want to hear this, but it's true. Corey Davis – had the best training camp out of all the receivers. The best. He was targeted the most. He had the most touchdowns. He was the most reliable wide receiver. And he had the most consistent, best training camp in training camp. That is not... That's not opinions. That's a fact. So, allow Corey Davis... Allow your expectations to be high for Corey entering this season. He's going to be impactful big time. Um, so I'm excited for Corey Davis, man. For him to be a wide receiver three on this team shows you how deep this roster truly is. Now let's get into Garrett Wilson, the rookie. Garrett Wilson. Now what can we expect from him? Um, <laughs> I'm expecting good things from Garrett Wilson, man. Like if you guys watch One Jets Drive... Oh, wait, before we get into Garrett Wilson, we got a, an awesome donation to get into. Yo, shout out from Brazil. Keep up the great work. Let's effing go Jets. Avant, thank you so much, my man. This is an excellent donation. Very generous. Thank you so much. Everyone give my man Avant a shout out in the chat. Let's go Jets. We have Jets fans supporting Jets media from Brazil. Are you kidding me? Thank you so much, my man. This does mean a lot to the channel. You got, you have no idea how much this means to the channel, my man. Thank you so much. Really, really does appreciate it. Uh, really does mean a lot to the channel, my man. Hope you are representing the Jets big time down there in Brazil and showing all your friends that the Jets are on the come up. I respect Jets fans that are like not from New York and from you know different countries because why are they choosing the Jets? The Jets have been terrible for so long. People like myself and, uh, and you guys watching – you know, typical Jets fans, we grow up, whether it's because we are, it's in the family, it's our father, it's our parents, it's our uncle, it's a mother, who knows who it is, but someone in the family kind of brings you up as a Jets fan. And there's other people that find the Jets on their own, whether it's just because they, they liked them back when Mark Sanchez was good or, or, you know, back, I'm talking about young Jets fans right now, like myself, um, you know, Curtis Martin, all those days, we fell in love with that team at a young age. And then we are just so loyal. So it's really cool to see that we have um, a Brazilian Jets fan. So thank you so much for the donation, my man. Big time dub. Now getting back into Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson, this could be a really interesting season for him because as a rookie, 10th overall, what, what I saw from preseason Garrett Wilson is he's different. I mean, he is completely different than any other guy we have in this roster. Different than Elijah Moore, different than Corey, different than Barry. Like, he is so athletic. He's so fluid with his routes. He is has long strides. He could his catch radius is the best part about him. Where if the ball is thrown towards Garrett Wilson and it's not the best ball, whether it's too high, it's to the right, it's to the left, it's it's low, he has ridiculous catch radius to reel it in. I mean, we saw that catch he had. Um I think that was week two against the Falcons from Mike White. It was like he didn't really get good separation on it, but it was like a quick little eight yard like like curl route. Didn't really get good, good separation, but the ball was thrown. Terrible ball by Mike White, but he just somehow rips it out of the air, snags it. Like th that's the little things that Garrett Wilson possesses. And I think Garrett Wilson, as a rookie, he's not going to come out of the gate on fire. I don't think. I don't think he's going to you know dominate from week one to week two. But I do think that as the season progresses, you're going to see Garrett Wilson get more comfortable. Similarly to Elijah Moore last year, Elijah Moore kind of had a, a a slow start to his rookie season, and then he really kicked off and. Connecting it to Elijah Moore real quick. If you guys watched One Jets Drive this past week, I loved what Elijah Moore had to say about Garrett Wilson. Elijah Moore said that he calls Garrett Wilson a rock star because he's very unique. He he trusts himself. He has an inner confidence to the point where he's not asking a lot of people for advice. He, he has so much confidence in himself. He wants to do things his own way. He's not asking somebody, okay, wh what do I do about this situation? He is such an inner inner peace and an inner confidence of who he is as a person that he knows that he's going to dominate 
without like worrying about what everybody else is doing. He wants to do things his own Garrett Wilson way. He wants to do it with his own inner swagger. And I thought that was so cool that we have a, a wide receiver in Garrett Wilson that has that swagger, has that star mentality at such a young age. He, he's going to break out and be um, an absolute stud for the Jets in the long run. And then, and then of course, we have to talk about Elijah Moore. I mean, I, that's my favorite player on the entire Jets. Elijah Moore, spam those eight ball emojis in the chat for me right now. And also, if you think Elijah Moore is breaking out this season, smash that thumbs up button because you guys all know that Elijah Moore is my guy. Elijah Moore, I think that he is going to put up numbers this year. I really think that this is the season where the Jets finally have a breakout wide receiver that we drafted, and he's a star across the NFL. He's going really late in your fantasy drafts. If you did not get a fantasy, if you did not draft anybody, in, um, excuse me, if you did not have your fantasy draft yet, Draft Elijah Moore. Even if, if you have to get him around early, do that. Because I did that in my other league. I was like, all right, I'm on the clock. This is a little reach for Elijah here, but I'm not risking it. Because if I wait until next round, there's a couple Jets fans in my in my draft. I'm not risking it. I'm drafting him right now as my starting flex. Because Elijah Moore possesses so much. His mentality, his faith, his everything about him in terms of his off-the-field qualities translates to his on the field success his route running his quickness his shiftiness his everything about it elijah moore is going to have over 1000 yards no doubt in my mind the only thing that's going to hold that back is it is him not playing a full season if elijah moore plays 17 games 1000 yards seven plus touchdowns that is that is guaranteed in my eyes i really do not see a world where Elijah Moore does not reach a thousand yards. And I think he can get more than that. I think so. And I know some people don't like hearing like uh, this player was on pace for this, but in those five games before his injury at the end of the year, if you stretch out Elijah Moore, those five games into a 17 game pace, you guys wouldn't even believe what, what he was on pace for. If you, if he did those, if he did something similar in those five games throughout the entire season, 1,400 yards and 14 touchdowns. Now, is he going to do that all season? I don't I, I, I don't know, right? That, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to expect him to put up 14 touchdowns and 1,400 yards. I think that's a little bit overboard. But I think there's no denying that he has the potential to get over 1,000 yards and get around 7-plus touchdowns. I think he's going to establish himself as a top receiver in the NFL. And a lot of fan bases around the league are going to look at Elijah Moore and say, damn, that, that guy's a stud. I love him. Like, I think he's going to become one of those fan favorites around the league where, oh, I want an Elijah Moore jersey. Outside of us Jets fans, because we're going to love Elijah, we already do, but I think it's this is the season where he's going to have a lot of flashy one-handers, he's going to get a crazy snag, he's going to make people miss in the open field, he's going to have a lot of flashy plays, where people are going to be like, damn, Elijah Moore is a beast. Now, getting into Denzel Mims. Denzel Mims is very interesting, because we heard from him yesterday to the media. Um, uh, Denzel Mims. He is valued in this franchise. So we heard Joe Douglas was looking if if um, the only way Joe Douglas was trading Denzel is if he was getting a fourth round pick in return. And there's no teams out there willing to pay that price. And I'm okay with that because what Denzel Mims brings is depth. Now, selfishly as a Jets fan, I want Denzel Mims on this roster for depth. But if you take my Jets fandom out and you put your brain in, if you put your mind where Denzel's at in his head, he feels like he is at the peak of his being so far in the NFL, and he wants to play. He's frustrated. It makes sense. You want him to be frustrated because he's a player that doesn't feel like he should be coming off the bench. Now, you want that confidence in him, right? Now, the one thing I, the one thing this is a good thing is Corey Davis, as much as I praised him um, when we were highlighting him earlier, he does have injury concerns. He was injured a lot last year. Denzel Mims provides the depth behind Corey Davis. If Corey Davis goes down, Denzel Mims steps into Corey Davis's role because they're both that six foot two, six foot three, prototypical big uh, bodied receiver. So that's why he has a lot of value on this roster, which is why the Jets are not just ready to move off of him. They want depth. They need quality depth. And guys, it's inevitable. Denzel Mims will be playing football this season. Injuries are a part of the game. And Denzel Mims is going to be out there. And what we saw against the Giants in the preseason finale is a little glimpse of what he can do if you can give him targets. I know that was against backups, but I genuinely believe Denzel Mims has that talent. I love him out of Baylor, and I hope that if his if his uh, name is called, the Jets feed him the ball, and he really makes uh, a lot of value based on his. Um, I really hope he takes advantage of his role 
if his name is called. Now, the sixth receiver, who could be wide receiver five as well, if you want to say it like that, is uh, Jeff Smith. Now, Jeff Smith is more a special teams guy. Um, he definitely will be out there if there's any injuries for sure. You know, he had a touchdown in the game against the Giants, which was cool to see. Uh, Jeff Smith isn't, you know, a receiver. Listen, I'm, we're talking about wide receiver five or six right now. Like, we got to, like, relax ourselves. I feel like Jets fans are getting a little over overkill, like, you know, shitting on our, like, last player on the depth chart at a certain position. Like, we, every single player at every single position cannot be dominant and cannot be amazing, okay? Um, if that was the case, we'd be Super Bowl team, a Super Bowl team right now. <laughs> so, Jeff Smith, not really too much to say about him. I, I think he's reliable that to the point where he knows the system well enough where if his name is called, he can get out there and get open and make some plays on third down. Now, um, let's get into the tight ends. The tight end room. Look at these four guys. CJ Uzama, Tyler Conklin, Lawrence Cager, and Jeremy Rucker. Let's start off with uh, CJ Uzama. CJ Uzama is that guy that's going to be providing a veteran impact going to be very reliable for whoever the quarterback is on third down in the red zone is going to be a very hot target um you know crossing routes breakdown plays when when the when the quarterback evades pressure whether it's zach wilson or joe flacco um and you need a broken down play cj uzama has a great feel for the game to know how to get open in those scenarios cj uzama is a veteran he's going to be an excellent culture guy i would not be shocked if he's voted as a captain on this team and i really think cj uzama is such a big impact for the season as well now, Tyler Conklin, I think Conklin's going to have the most um, impact in terms of the tight end room. If I'm going to predict who leads this tight end room in stats, I think Tyler Conklin's going to lead the tight ends in receptions. I think Tyler Conklin's going to lead the tight ends in yards. I think CJ Uzama is going to lead the tight end room in touchdowns. That's my prediction. I think CJ Uzama is going to be that key red zone target, whereas Tyler Conklin is going to be that guy that's getting all the receptions and all the yards on first and second, third down. Not to say Conklin is not going to find the end zone. Conklin's going to get in the end zone a ton, but I think that that's my perception of this wider, of these tight ends because they're both going to be on the field at the same time. Look at it just like you know Elijah Moore, Garrett Wilson are on this field at the same time. It's going to be Uzama and Conklin as the starting two tight ends making some big plays and i definitely am excited to see what those two guys can do because seeing them in preseason it's like wow we actually have tight ends jets fans have been waiting forever for this absolutely forever um and now lawrence cager one of the most awesome stories on this entire team man lawrence cager undrafted free agent for the new york jets back in 2019 in joe douglas's first draft class came up as a wide receiver had a had a couple games with sam darnold got injured um, and then, then the year after that, the Jets cut him. He gets signed by the Cleveland Browns, I believe. Comes back to the Jets, transitions from wide receiver to tight end. No one's really thinking anything of it. Like, oh, wow, Cager's trying to be a tight end. And then behind the scenes, Lawrence Cager puts up weight, put, absolutely transforms his physical body into a really beast um, tight end. And now he is tight end number three, tight end number four. And I think that he's a versatile nightmare. He's going to be out there lined up against linebackers. And Robert Sala had an awesome joke to say that Lawrence Cager went from being a slow wide receiver to a fast tight end. We saw what he did in the preseason with his yak abilities, the touchdown that he had. If you give the ball to Cager on a crossing route over the middle, he's going to be able to pick up a bunch of yards in the yak opportunities that he gets. He's a guy that's going to be a versatile piece. And I absolutely love it because he brings a different element to this tight end room. If we just kept Trevon Wesco, it would have been so boring. It would have been like another just blocking tight end. What Cager brings is another weapon for our quarterback. That's what we want. We want weapons. We want weapons, baby. So the fact that the Jets keep Lawrence Cager tells me so much about where this Jets mindsets are at in terms of this offense and really prioritizing weapons. Now, Jeremy Rucker. He's going to be tight end number four to start things off because he's been a little slow. He's been uh, playing catch up because he was not able to participate in OTAs because of his foot problem. He was able to play limited in preseason um, at the end. And I think Jeremy Rucker, when his name is called, he's going to be really good in blocking right away. And um, he looked good. I mean, he looks really smooth out there when his name was called in the preseason. He had no drops. Whenever the ball is thrown to him, he caught it in space. You know, took on some contact, looks pretty good, looked excellent in blocking opportunities, which you want to see immediately from Jeremy Rucker. So uh, the, the tight end room is deep, man. And then you got to bring up Kenny Oboa in the practice squad, where if one of these four tight ends unfortunately goes down, Kenny Oboa is the next man up, and I absolutely love it. So, and another thing about Cager that I want to bring up, because I see John in the chat talking about Cager and his blocking. 
Robert Sala said that Lawrence Gager is a guy that is definitely able to block. He is not a liability in the blocking at all. Um, they feel like if he's on the field, they can run the ball. He's a willing blocker. And they they said that Gager would not have made the 53-man roster if he'd not become a willing blocker. Now, is he the, the weakling of the blocking in terms of the guys in the room of Ozama, Conklin, Rucker? Absolutely. Those three guys are definitely better blockers than him. But according to Sala, he's a willing blocker. He's evolving as a blocker. And they have a lot of confidence in him to be able to be good in running block, uh, run blocking and even pass blocking. Now, let's get into the offensive line. Offensive line, we'll start off with the tackle position. Left tackle, Dwayne Brown. Now, oh my gosh, are we are we lucky to have Dwayne Brown, man? Because when we all saw that Makai Beckett was out for the season, that could not have come at a worse time. That was just terrible blow. But it does make the, the Makai Beckett situation feel a lot better that we signed Dwayne Brown. The Pro Bowler last year for the Seahawks, uh, a seasoned veteran. He's a guy that's really going to help gel this offensive line together next to the Pro Bowler and Lincoln Tomlinson as well. Uh, what Dwayne Brown's going to bring, you know, in the limited times that we saw him in the in the preseason, he was perfect. Did not let the uh, the opposing defense touch the quarterback once. His job is to protect the quarterback, protect the blind side, and open up holes in the running game, of course. Uh, Lincoln Tomlinson, he looked like an absolute dog against the Giants. Pancaking people, running people to the ground. Lincoln Tomlinson has a different violence to him. He just has a really good feel for the game of football. And I think he is going to be the X factor for this entire offensive line to take it up another notch in the run game, in the passing game, and also just leadership wise and gelling it. Because an offensive line, all five of them need to be on a string. They need to have good communication. They need to know when they need to help each other. And I feel like Lincoln Tomlinson is that piece to really make this offensive line take a big-time step. Connor McGovern, you know, he's definitely the weak link of this offensive line, but all offensive line cannot be great. Otherwise, we'd be, you know, one of the best in the league. Um, I think Connor McGovern is going to be, you know, an average center this year. I think him being sandwiched between Lincoln and AVT is going to help him out a ton. Um, I think that's going to make his job a lot easier. Now, Elijah Vera Tucker, we're going to see his first season with the Jets at the right guard spot. As a rookie, he was the left guard, uh, and year number two is going to be the right guard. I love AVT, man. You love it because he had no issues moving to the right side. He was the first round pick last year for the Jets. And now, like, these guards are just, like, insane. I mean, we have the Pro Bowler Lincoln Tomlinson. We have a Pro Bowl potential in Elijah Vera Tucker. I mean, I think Elijah Vera Tucker is destined to have a really good season. He might have a little bit of um, growing to do at first because he is transitioning to one side. He might have a couple holding penalties and might get beat here and there. You know, we cannot expect Elijah Vera Tucker to be just the best right guard of football right away. That's not going to be the case because he's 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 learning a new position. Even though it's the same position just on the other side, it's, you got to flip flip everything around your head. That's really everything. He's got to flip everything around. A lot easier said than done, obviously. And then George Fant. George Fant is another guy that you just got to respect. I mean, he had the left tackle spot ready to go. It was his job. The, the Jets coaching staff let him earn it. He got it. He won it. And then totally out of his control, Makai is the one that gets hurt. George Fan did nothing wrong. And then they side Brown, and Brown is a left tackle. So you're not going to put Brown on the right side. Fan has experience there. You slide Fan back to the right tackle spot. That is the prototypical captain, a guy that's looking to get paid as an extension. And George Fan is going to be a really interesting piece to that right tackle spot next to Elijah Vera Tucker. Uh, Fenton and AVT were together on the left side last year, and now they're going to be together on the right side, which is really cool to see that the Jets completely flipped over the offensive line in one offseason. But I think this is going to be the starting offensive line this season, and hopefully the same starting five offensive line next year if Mekhi Beckton's not, um, not starting, which we obviously prefer. And then going into the depth of the offensive line, definitely not the best depth we've ever had. Max Mitchell is the only guy at the tackle spot. Um, Connor McDermott's expected to come back, but he is injured. Um, Robert Sala has a lot of glowing things to say about Max Mitchell, man. He, they feel like he can come in at left tackle or right tackle since the injury to Makai Beckett, and he had a lot of room to play. He got a lot of reps with the starters, got a lot of reps with the backups. They feel like Max Mitchell is ready to go, and they feel like he's going to be a very quality player in the NFL, and he still needs a lot of work to do. He's, he's learning, but I do feel like, um, Max Mitchell is one of those guys that the Jets coaching staff is extremely high on. And let's hope that Max Mitchell does not touch the field once as a rookie. That's the goal, guys. We do not want Max Mitchell on the field. I don't know why. Because we want Fant and Brown healthy all season long. All season long. Come on. Please. Please. And then the two 
uh, offensive linemen that are on the interior that's going to be backups, starting off with Nate Herbig. Nate Herbig looked really good uh, in the preseason. Uh, left guard, he's going to be able to plug in a right guard or left guard if one of those two goes down. Again, let's hope that they are all healthy. Um, I think Nate Herbig was a very slept-on acquisition from Joe Douglas on the waivers back in May. Um had a lot of playing time with Philadelphia. And I think that, you know, he's replacing Greg Van Roten. And sign me up. I think he's a miles better than uh, Greg Van Roten. So this is another excellent player that Joe Douglas has acquired off the waiver wire. And I think um, he's going to provide a big-time impact if his name is called. And, of course, the legend Dan Feeney, the mullet, um, he's going to be the backup center, and he's also going to provide a depth at the a guard spot. I love Dan Feeney because he's very versatile. He can play center. He can play in the guard spot. Definitely not the greatest offensive line in the world. We do not want Dan Feeney out there. But the one thing I will say that Dan Feeney deserves credit is Dan Feeney, the one game he played last year when Elijah Vera Tucker had COVID against the Jacksonville Jaguars, the Jets had the most rushing yards by any team in the league at that point. I think it was like 250 yards on the ground. That was the game that Zach Wilson had those crazy runs. That was the game that Tevin Coleman and, and Michael Carter had a phenomenal game uh, on the ground. And Dan Feeney was the left guard on that game. And he was a big reason for that running attack in the trenches. So if Dan Feeney's name is going to be called, he has a lot of experience. And I think that, you know, he's definitely not the greatest offensive line. But again, guys, we're talking about backup right now. We cannot expect every single player on this roster to be phenomenal. If that was the case, we'd be, you know, competing for the <laughs> Super Bowl, which hopefully we will be soon. Bang with another $2 donation. Why only one backup offensive tackle a rookie at that? I think Connor McDermott is another guy to expect to be the backup tackle. He's just injured, which is why they're uh, going to resign him and put him on the injured reserve. Um, but listen, they got a lot of confidence in Max Mitchell, and let's hope that um, Max Mitchell does not have to touch the field. As much as I want to see him play, I just want to see Fenton Brown healthy. Uh, appreciate the donation, Bang. Um, so, to finish things off, we're going to um, channel back into the quarterbacks. Because we started off with the quarterbacks, but we didn't really talk about Zach Wilson a lot. And Zach Wilson is a big time, probably the most important player on this entire roster. So, let's, let's finish things off with Zach. But guys, before we get into Zach, can we get the 200 likes before the stream is wrapped up? 158 likes with over 300 people tuning into this live show right now. Do me a favor. Smash that thumbs up button right now for your boy so we get as many Jets fans in the stream and as many Jets fans watching Jets media. And also, if you're not subscribed to the channel, help me out to get to my new goal, 13K before the season wrap uh, it kicks off in 10 days. That will be absolutely phenomenal stuff. Do me a favor, guys, and smash those buttons. Really does mean a lot. And, of course, hit the bell notification so you get notified every time your boy goes live or makes a video. So, Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson. Woo wee! This is your time, Zach. This is it. We have been waiting forever to crown a franchise quarterback with confidence. For anybody who's saying Zach is the bona fide franchise quarterback, don't do that just yet. I'm not saying he's not going to become that. My point is, we're hopeful that Zach Wilson's a franchise quarterback, but there's no evidence that he is yet. Sorry, guys. It's the truth. I'm not here to give you guys lies, right? Be real rather than nice. I think Zach Wilson has every single quality to be a franchise quarterback. He has the physical makeup. He has the physical gifts. He has the arm. He has the legs. He has the body. He has everything. He has the athleticism. He, he checks every single box as a franchise quarterback physically. Now... This is going to be the deciding factor for Zach Wilson of being the franchise quarterback. Mentally. Is Zach Wilson going to be able to make the right decisions? Is he going to be able to not overcomplicate things? Is he going to be able to simplify the game? Because do you want to know why Zach Wilson struggled with the short throw accuracy passes? It's not because he doesn't have good accurate arm. It's because he's overthinking things. He's looking around. This is his rookie season I'm talking about. He was looking around, didn't really have the proper uh, fundamentals. Um, his mind and his body wasn't in line. So, which is why Joe Flacco is such a great veteran to learn from. Because Joe Flacco mastered the game of football mentally. But Joe Flacco is behind physically. You guys get what I'm saying? So, Zach Wilson needs the, the, the game to slow down for him. Play within the structure of the offense. 
understand where the ball needs to go. Definitely needs to make sure that he is not staring at one receiver at all times. He needs to work on his eyes. He needs to look off this corner, bring the ball over there, look to the left, boom. Because that interception he had in preseason, he was staring at that way the whole time. Didn't see the linebacker at all. So what's going to make or break Zach Wilson this year is playing smart football, protecting the ball, getting the ball in the playmaker's hands, um, and getting rid of the ball fast as well. We do not want to see him hold on to the ball too long like he did last year. That prevented a lot of sacks. Get rid of the ball fast. So I feel like Zach Wilson, a lot of pressure is on him right now, and that's a fact. And like Jets fans, we're coming off an offseason that's pretty historic. Absolutely historic in terms of looking at what we did in the draft, what we did in this entire offseason, and plugging this entire team with talent. This is one of the most talented rosters that we've had on paper going into a season in quite some time. And the best part about it is it's stacked with offensive playmaking talent. Which brings you to the point that it's all up to Zach. Like, all the talent that we've acquired isn't going to mean shit if Zach Wilson's not the guy. Now, I'm not expecting Zach Wilson to be a Joe Burrow or Justin Herbert um, and take that step of putting up 40-plus touchdowns right now. But Zach Wilson, you need to put up 25-plus touchdowns. You need to put up 10, 11 picks minimum, or maximum, rather. <laughs> we, don't want, we don't want him to go over that, is what, what, what I meant. We need to have a 2-to-1 touchdown to interception ratio. We also need Zach Wilson to be the reason that, he, that we won a lot of football games. I want Zach Wilson to take over a game in the fourth quarter. Because you see all these young quarterbacks in the NFL. You see what Josh Allen's doing. You see Mahomes. You see Herbert. You see Burrow. You see Lamar Jackson. You see these young quarterbacks. You know what the qualities that they show? They show an ability to take over the game in the fourth quarter. And whether you have a lead, protect it, or you're coming from behind, you show the clutch factor. I think Zach Wilson has it in him, but he needs to prove it. However, wins, however many wins we have this year, Zach Wilson needs to be able to single-handedly win us some football games. That's the quarterback's job. I know it's a team sport. I'm not expecting Zach to do everything. But what I mean by that is there needs to be some games late in the fourth quarter that Zach Wilson just absolutely elevates this team around him and proves to be the guy. Because this, the reality is this, guys. I'm sorry. I don't want to be blunt with you. But this Jets team, as Robert Sala said it yesterday, we want to win championships. I think we can all agree that we're not going for the championship this year, even though you can never say never. But we're never going to the Super Bowl in the future if Zach Wilson is not the guy. So this is the year for our quarterback to prove that Zach Wilson is the guy. Because the pressure's on, Zach. Now, I think that the Jets are going to give him three years, including last year. So this is year two. And they're going to give him next year to prove himself. No matter what he looks like this year, he's still going to be the starting quarterback next year. For sure. Um, so... That's really my assessment on Zach Wilson. The pressure's on. He needs to really step up. He needs to show improvement that he has the ability to elevate guys around him. He has a clutch gene. He can uh, get the ball in the open space. He can make people miss. He's not reckless with the football. He's smart, making the proper decisions. I genuinely believe Zach Wilson possesses everything you would want in a quarterback in, in today's league. Someone in the chat said that Zach has 40 touchdown potential. He absolutely does. I don't think he's going to do that this year, but Zach Wilson in his prime, if he can live up to what we expected. And remember, guys, Zach Wilson is a second overall pick here. This isn't a guy that we drafted in the second, third round. We're hoping to just break out. Zach Wilson is expected to be a top quarterback in the league. If you're drafted with the second overall pick, you're expected to be the guy right away. Like year two, rookie, you get, you get a lot of excuses. You get the rookie excuse. Year two with all of these players around him, I mean, look at this. We're surrounded. I surrounded myself with them. With Elijah Moore, with Garrett Wilson, with Corey Davis, with Uzama and Conklin and Hall and Carter and the stacked O line. Like, there's no excuse. This is the first time that Jets fans are going into a season where there's no excuses for the quarterback. That's crazy. And I'm okay with that. I absolutely hate when I had to say that. Oh, yeah, well, the reason why Geno Smith or Sam Darnold or whoever the quarterback was is not playing well is because look at the playmakers around him. That's not the case anymore. You can't say that. 
You can't say the reason why Zach Wilson's not playing good football is because of the talent around him. That excuse, out the door. There's no more excuses for Zach. We got to hold him accountable. And I told you guys, I, I believe in Zach Wilson. I trust him. But I also learned from my mistake of crowning Sam Darnold as the franchise quarterback way too prematurely. I was so hungry for a franchise quarterback that when we drafted him, I thought he was the guy right away. I get his jersey. My expectation is he's the man. Week number one against the, the Lions on Monday night, that game, pick six. I'm like, okay, he sucks. And then he wins it 48 to 17. And I'm like, Sam Darnold is my franchise quarterback. He's going to be the guy forever. And then we all know how that happened. So I learned from my mistake. I'm not crowning Zach Wilson as the franchise quarterback until he proves it. That does not mean I do not think that he could become that. I think Zach Wilson has everything to, to, to be the guy. I also do not own a Zach Wilson jersey. And I told you guys when we drafted him, I'm not... I'm not buying a Zach Wilson jersey until he's absolutely proved to be the franchise quarterback that we are 100% going to give a, a contract extension that's going to get paid a lot of money. That's what I told myself because I, I had two Sam Donald jerseys at a signed Sam football, and I'm just not going to be the guy that's just going to crown a franchise quarterback too prematurely. And let me say this again. If Zach Wilson plays football this year and he's, you know, he plays good, right? He, say he has like a similar season to Josh Allen in year number two, right? Josh Allen showed some improvement in year number two, but he was not the Josh Allen he is today. He was still inaccurate, reckless, still had a lot of things to work on. Hell, there were some Buffalo Bills fans questioning Josh Allen going into year three. So I'm not expecting Zach Wilson to be like the man right now. I really am not. All I want to see from Zach Wilson is to prove to be making strides in the right direction, have a positive two to one touchdown to interception ratio, completion percentage definitely has to improve because it was really bad last year, and just show that he's trending up. I mean, it's that simple. Consistency, getting the ball in space, and that's really it's really that simple, man. I'm not expecting Zach to be Josh Allen or Mahomes or Herbert. I don't think he like I'm not expecting that this year from him. But at the end of the day. When you're drafted second overall and you're entering your number two and you have the talent around you like this, there's no more babying him. Like, if he stinks it up, that's going to be a problem. But if he plays average football, you know, he puts up two touchdowns, two picks, 300 yards, but we win, or three touchdowns, two picks, or one touchdown, but he managed the game beautifully and we got we ran the ball well. Like, listen... It's not all on Zach to, to be, you know, the guy to win us football games because there's a lot of other players that needs to be gelling. But this is the year where Zach Wilson needs to step up and prove to the rest of the league that we made the right decision. Because everybody knows, the entire NFL knows that it's all on Zach Wilson to see if this Jets team is anything. Because everyone's praising this roster. Even the rivals, like... I know some Dolphins and Bills fans and Patriots fans that are respecting this Jets team this year in terms of the talent that we have. But they're all saying, yeah, but Zach Wilson's got to prove him, prove himself. And they're 100% correct. Zach Wilson does got to prove himself because no one's going to crown the Jets as a serious threat in this division until Zach Wilson proves himself. Because want to know why the Buffalo Bills are the consensus team to win the division now? And the, and the consensus team to potentially win a Super Bowl and win the AFC, it's because Josh Allen is the best quarterback, arguably, in the NFL. So I'm not expecting Zach Wilson to become the best quarterback in the NFL, but we need Zach Wilson to become top 12 this year, like eventually, top 15. If Zach Wilson's in the top 15 quarterbacks this year, that's a big positive. Is that too much to ask for Zach Wilson to be top, top 15 this year? Is that too much to ask to be in the, in the upper half of the league? I think it's possible. I genuinely believe Zach Wilson possesses all the qualities necessary to get the deal done. So I'm really excited about this Jets roster right now. 
Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun to see where this Jets team ends up. And I I'm just pumped up, man. I'm just really pumped up. So that's my assessment of the entire Jets roster. We broke down the defense. We broke down the offense. If you guys could do me a favor, let's get to 200 likes before the, se before the stream is wrapped up. We got 185 likes with 280 people tuning in. I genuinely appreciate each and every one of you guys tuning into the stream, man. That's going to wrap it up. Uh, I broke down the offense. I broke down the defense. It was a lot of fun to break down this with you guys. I got into each individual player. There's a lot that I broke down in this. So if you guys stayed until the end, if you watched from the beginning, you guys are awesome. Um, this was a really fun stream. And um, yeah, hit that like button if you did not already. So we get 200 likes, 190 likes with 275 of you guys still in here. Thank you guys for all the support on Jets Media. Expect more daily live streams and daily content here on the channel, of course. That's going to wrap up this edition of the Jets Media full roster breakdown. If you guys want to do me a favor and subscribe to the AFC East Roundtable as well, our dedicated YouTube channel is down below in the description. Hit that thumbs up. And that does it for the stream, baby. Let's go Jets! Expect a lot more content coming your way all the way up until week number one. Peace out, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.